Hello everyone, welcome back to the Second Circle, a Helltaker fan game. Let's go ahead and continue. So today, I think we're gonna go with uh, all the last remaining two and before Lucy for so, uh, judgment. Though it has been a while since you visited the Butterfly Conservatory with judgment, that they remain to the forefront of your thoughts. While you originally intended to use it only as a way to engage the higher prosecutor on one of her apparent interests, you feel yourself growing similarly intrigued by the fluttering creatures. This curiosity of yours drives you to peruse the literature that was handed out after the tour. According to the pamphlet, it is possible to donate butterfly snacks tubs of sliced up fruit to the conservatory as a way of helping out and getting involved. Thinking this is the perfect way to satisfy your interest, you make your way to the kitchen. However, on the way you pass by Judgment's shut door. Looking at it reminds you of how that day ended. You lament the fact that you've seen the precious little of her since then. Should I try knocking the door again? Though hesitant, you decide to try one last time to get her attention. As you knock, you strain your ears to listen for signs of movement inside. Judgment? You're nothing. I was just going to do some work in the kitchen, and I was wondering if you'd like to help out. Judgment? No response. Frowning, you return to the kitchen. Once there, you dig out a knife, cutting board, and every bit of fruit you have stashed away in the pantry. Then, after donning your apron, you set to work slicing everything up into small cubes. As you are working, you hear someone enter the kitchen at your back. Turning, you are surprised to see none other than Judgment standing in the doorway. Oh. Hey there, Judgment. The demon stares back at you, wide-eyed and blushing. Hey, Taker. I was just looking for a snack. With a nod, you return your attention to the task at hand. Though you can hear Judgment rummaging around the patch behind you, you can feel her gaze burning a hole at your back. Soon enough, the clatter stops and Judgment steps up next to you to peer around your shoulder. Um, what are you doing? Making fruit medleys. What for? Butterfly snacks. Oh, I see. Can, can I help you? Wordlessly, you hand judgment an apron and a knife before slapping down a cutting board next to you and stepping inside to get the demoness room to work. Judgment approaches this countertop and removes your gauntlets. Then the two of you is set to work chopping up fruit and dividing it into dozens of plastic containers. Aw, look how cute Judgment is. That's uh, cute. Cutting up fruit like that. Soon the tapping your knives against the cutting boards echoes throughout the kitchen. And amid this quiet rhythm, you notice a faint smell dancing across Judgment's lips. Smiling in turn, you continue your task. Have you given any more thoughts to your predicament? Predicament? Wait a minute, what's that in the back? Is that like, uh, is that a, oh, is that, what's her name? Jolene Cujo? Maybe. What are you referring to, mortal? The butterflies. Shall we fortify our home against the coming invasion? Ah. Uh, perhaps. Or perhaps we should explore other avenues. Such as? Diplomacy. Diplomacy. Yes. 
If we can placate the bees with sustenance, we can avoid any unnecessary bloodshed. I see. Is that what we would prefer? I would. Hmm. As would I. Judgment grins and dumps another load of fruit into plastic containers. As you prepare to do the same, you're in something that catches you by surprise. Judgment has begun to hum. The sound of her voice fills the room, and you find yourself looking at the demoness in shock. Judgment, I... All of a sudden, the scent of smoke stings your nose. The hell is going on in the air? I thought I caught a whiff of something sweet coming from the kitchen, and so I got hungry. That's just you, nerds. Hey, Zadrata. Don't worry. I'll get started on dinner after I'm done here. Good. What are you doing anyway? I wanted to make fruit melees to donate to Butterfly Conservatory, and Judgment, you're offered to help. The demon puts her hand up her mouth and makes a gagging noise. Ugh, forget I asked. Though I guess I shouldn't be surprised that you'd do something like this, Taker. I am, however, a little shocked at you, Judgment. I would have known that the High Prosecutor of Hell would do something so sickeningly nice. Next thing I know, you'll be letting sinners lie for a few decades with an IOU, Eternal Damnation. Oh, hey. That already happened, didn't it? Looks like somebody's losing their hedge. Before you can protest, Sidrara breaks out in a cackle. Speaking smoke with her each hearty guffaw, the demoness wife swipes a box of crackers off of the counter and departs, leaving you in judgment alone in the kitchen once more. Silence descends upon you, yet the ring is a dry laughter still echoes in your ear. Jeez, what's her problem? Shaking your head, you look over at judgment. The demoness is facing the counter with her hands gripping the sides of her cutting board hard enough to turn her knuckles white. At first, you think that this is a display of anger, but the slight, gimmer, uh, the slight glimmer of tears in the corner of her eyes causes you to think otherwise. Judgment? Fool. I... I'm sorry? May I take my leave now? Yeah, I can take it from here. With that, Judgment removes her apron, seizes her gauntlets, and scurries out of the kitchen. A moment later, you hear your bedroom door slam shut. Left to yourself once again, you allow a long sigh before finishing, some, eh, finishing up with your task. Thanks to Judgment's help, there isn't much left to do. It only takes you a few minutes to slice up the last few pieces of fruit and divide that up into melees. Then you close up the containers, wash off the knife, and load everything up into a couple of boxes for transport. As you are carrying these boxes out to the car, Justice approaches you. Hey, Chief, when's dinner? Oh, hey, Justice. Uh, I'll get started as soon as I get back. Nice, I'm starving. Where are you headed off to? I'm gonna take these fruit melis to Butterfly Conservatory. You made them yourself? No, Judgment helped out quite a bit. Judgment? That's a surprise. Straw said something similar. Straw saw? That's no good. What do you mean? If I can be frank, that one talks out of her ass so much, it's probably become a second mouth at this point. I'm guessing she said something that made Judgment leave, didn't she? Yeah, actually she did. Is Judgment okay? I wonder about that myself sometimes. Is there something I should know? I'd say. Let me begin by saying that Judgment and I have been friends for a very long time, Taker. Heck, 
anywhere back when I was the high prosecutor. So there's a lot of history there, and it can get a little messy. But if it's you, perhaps I can let you in on a few things. If it'll help me understand judgment more, I'm all ears. That's what I like to hear. Alright. First, let me start by saying that judgment wasn't always the high prosecutor that you know today. Before I chose her as my successor, she was known as the nicest demon. Seriously? Seriously. Well, that explains a few things. Go on. For a long time, she wore that title with pride. But then she took the position of high prosecutor. Everything changed after that. Her old title became something of a hindrance for her. How could demons and sinners respect someone who was so well known for being nice? Hell isn't a terribly kind place to those who are nice. So, with my help, she did what she had to do. She killed a nice part of herself. In a way. Rather, and I'm ashamed now to admit that this was primarily my idea, she suppressed her true nature in favor of a totally new persona, a facade that she wears whenever the situation demands that she must be the high prosecutor of hell. But... But... While at first Judgment was able to switch between these two images of herself, soon the high prosecutor side of her took more over completely and we never got to see the kind demon we once knew service again. I fear that maybe she's gone so deep into this other personality of hers that she can no longer snap out of it. Perhaps she's afraid that nobody will accept her old self. Huh. When I realized this, I mourned the friend I once knew and put forth effort to get to know the new judgment instead. It's been an adjustment, to say the least. But if what you say is true, Taker, maybe that barber is not dead after all. Maybe the kind demon is still looking around in there somewhere. Maybe. Thank you for telling me all this. There must be something I can do to help this situation. I truly hope there is, Taker. Because, I'm being honest with you, there's a part of me that misses the friend I used to have. Oh, Judgment. Who's next? Panda Monica? You, right? It's been a couple of weeks since you last caught sight of Panda Monica out in the open. Ever since your date at the odd coffee shop, the demon has been cooped up in her room. Though you still provide her with the morning coffee, you aren't permitted to enter her domain. Instead, you often leave the mug by a door like an offering, only to find it sitting empty in the very same place sometime later. This new arrangement has left a sour taste in your mouth, and you consider sitting the demoness down to figure out what's going on. Before you can, however, the unexpected occurs. It happens once e one evening after dinner as you're sitting in the living room watching television. You hear a noise like a door slamming and then catch a glimpse of blur scurry into the kitchen. At once you follow the figure and find none other than Panda Monica, wide-eyed and muttering as she rummages around in the pantry. The sight of her staying alone in the kitchen brings you a sense of deja vu. Panda Monica? The demoness turns toward you suddenly. Her hunched over stance reminds you of a wild animal standing hungrily for a fresh kill. Judging from the dark circles around her red rimmed eyes, you can't help but think that the demon hasn't been sleeping well, or even at all. Take her. Are you looking for the grinder? I've been using it so often that I don't put it away anymore. It's over there by the coffee machine. Panama got his eyes cut from you to the contraption sitting in the counter at your back. 
I can make you a cup of coffee now if you like. Yes, please. With a nod, you head over to Pantry where you stash the coffee bean that you and Panama get got from the shop on your last date. There, you are faced with a choice. What flavor should I make? Let's see. Maybe dark chocolate hazelnut. I think it's best to stick to the safe choice. Grab the bag dark chocolate hazelnut off the shelf and get to work. As you whip up a cup of freshly ground coffee, Panda Monica takes a seat by the table with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. Out of the corner of your eye, you catch a glimpse of the demon staring out the window, the orange glow of the street lamps outside spilling over her solemn expression. Only when you set the steaming beverage before does Panda Monica snap out of her melancholy. Thank you, Taker. No problem. You sit across on Demon and watch as she takes her first sip. Though her exhaustion does not simply leave her eyes, the smile that spreads across her face makes her look ten times more awake than she was before. Hmm, dark chocolate hazelnut. My favorite. Tastes like home. Panda Monica indulges herself further with another long sip from her mug. As you watch the demoness partake in her beverage, you mull over the ways you intend to broach the topic of absence. Before you can settle on something to say, however, the woman across from you sets down her mug and returns your gaze. I know I've been scarce lately. More than usual, that is. I'm sorry if that's been cause for concern. But I've had a lot to think about. I understand. Good. I'm glad to hear that. But also, I want to, you to know that you don't have to hide things from me. If this is something you'd rather keep to yourself, I won't press you any further on it. But if there's anything I can do to help, I hope you understand that you can't go to me. You don't have to tackle all of your problems alone, you know. I know that's late, but... Do you want to take a walk? A walk? Sure, but... There's just something I need to see for myself. Alright, walk it is then. The both of you rise from your seats at the same time. As you don your jacket, Panamanka slaps on an appropriate pair of walking shoes and waits for you by the door. Soon you find yourself venturing out into the cold night air. The evening air envelopes spool you both as you make your way around the block. With each step further from home, Panamaka lingers closer to you until your arms brush past one another as you walk. Once when Panamaka's elbow bumps against you, you peer down at the demon to see that she is shivering. Are you alright? It seems as though I didn't probably prepare for just how cold I was going to be. I thought this light jacket would be enough, but I'm chilled to the bone. I guess I'm not used to the climate here quite yet. Here, take my coat. Won't you be cold? I'm used to it. You drape your coat over Panamaka's shoulders, and once your shivering comes to an end and his expression softens. Ah, oh, that's so cute. It's so big. <laughs> oh. Compared to earlier, it's almost as though you're looking at a completely different person. Whereas before, an aura of distress and irritation seemed to seep out of her every pore, now it is as though Panamaka can no longer fathom just what it was that had irked her so. And this realization surprised her at most. Oh, eh. Oops. Damn, I can't read today. Let's try that again. And this realization surprised her almost as much as it does you. So much so, in fact, they can distinctly hear her mutter something under her breath. Though you don't catch it entirely, you're private to two words which ring loud and clear in your ears. Why now? 
Yep. Pardon? Oh, nothing. I just still have much on my mind. Should we head home? Not just yet, please. I want to savor this a little longer, if you don't mind. Alright. You continue onward for a while longer, stealing glances at the demon beside you as you walk. The change in the Panamaka's demeanor is unmistakable. But try as you might, you cannot figure out what it is that has brought upon such a stark change in personality. Soon you arrive at the small neighborhood playground, harkened by a sound of the swings creaking in the breeze. Panamaka stops in front of a large pine tree, one with many branches that lay low enough for children to climb. A small sigh escapes her lips, and she beckons you close. When you approach, she grabs your arm and hugs it close to her chest. Panamaka? Shh. It's quiet now. Let me enjoy the silence. You nod and stare up at the magnificent tree in front of you. If your memory serves, it's been here since you were a kid. You recall climbing its branches as well. What a sturdy thing it must be to withstand all those prying hands for so long. Most would crumble under the weight of so many things tugging at them constantly. But this tree has grown tall in spite of that. Oh dear. The sound of Panamaka's voice draws you out of your recollection. You look down at the demon clinging to your arm and frown. Your bliss is gone, evaporated into nothingness like the wilting fog on your breath. Suddenly, all that remains is sorrow. What's wrong? We should head back. Wait, Panamonica. What is it, Taker? Please tell me what's going on. I can't help you if I don't know. Exasperated, Panamaka plops down to swings and teeters to and fro in thought. Have you ever heard of pandemonium? It's a word that's like disorder and panic, right? Yes, but before that, it was a place. Pandemonium is the capital of hell. Okay. What about it? Can you guess what it's like there? I suppose there are a lot of demons there, right? Not just a lot of demons. Nearly all of them. Flying in and out of that one building all day and night. From the beginning of time until the end of time. It's loud there. Maddeningly so. All of the demons talk at once, like a sea of voices, and I imagine trying to discern one voice out of that sea. It'd be like searching for a particular drop of the water out of the ocean, wouldn't it? I suppose so. But why are you telling me all of this? Now imagine that you had to listen to that all day and all night without end. I'd go mad. Exactly. Some demons are born for a purpose, to serve hell in some specific fashion. I am one of those demons, and my purpose is to hear and address the concerns of the demons of hell. As such, I was made, in a way, to be the physical embodiment of pandemonium. So, all those voices are in my head. How do you sleep? Very little, I'm afraid. Hence the coffee. Is it always like that? It was. Until the other day. I never experienced true silence until then. When is that? When we were at the coffee shop. For the first time in my life, the voices stopped completely. 
Sometimes they fade, but they never go away like they did then. I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Or not hearing, rather. All I wanted to do was hang on to that feeling, that silence. But then, they came back. So that's what happened. Yes. And ever since that day, I've been trying to figure out why I was blessed with those few moments of peace. Did you come up with anything? Sadly, no. I've not been able to get a wink of sleep since then. After experiencing their absence, the voices feel louder than ever now. I'd all but given up on making them go away again. Until tonight. So they went away tonight too? Yes. They're back now, of course. But I wish I knew what it was that made them vanish in the first place. There must be something, but I just can't figure it out. I fear these brief respites are all that I can look forward to. In the end, the voices always return. What if there is something that can make them stop? Wouldn't that be something? I'd love to ponder the possibility, but I'm afraid I might be too tired for that. Can we head home? Yeah. Let's go. You stand and offer Panda Monica your arm. She grins warily at your offer and wraps herself around you. As you make your way home, the tired demon rests her cheek against her own arm, something which would, on any other night, linger at the forefront of your thoughts. Instead, you can only think of Panamaka's plight, pardoning what, if anything, you can do to help. By the time you arrive home and Panamaka slips off to bed, you find your mind buzzing with possibilities. I feel so sorry for Pan Monica. But we're gonna have to find out in the future. Anyways, if you want to try this out for yourself, the links will be provided down below. And please subscribe for more if you want to watch some more of this or other vision novels. Anyway, thank you and take care.